Thank you for joining us for this sermon podcast from United Church on the Green, located in New Haven, Connecticut. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are invited and welcome. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministry at United Church on the Green, please visit our website at unitednewhaven.org. Thank you. Good morning. Our reading this morning from the scripture is from the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah 2, verse 177. Righteousness does not consist in you turning your faces to the east or the west. Rather, righteous is the one who believes in God, the day of judgment, angels, scripture, and all the prophets, who distributes cherished wealth to relatives, to orphans, to the needy, to travelers, to beggars, and who uses it to free the unfree, who regularly performs the prescribed prayers and gives prescribed alms. The righteous are those who fulfill a promise when they make one, who are steadfast in the face of hardship, calamity, and danger. Those are the true believers. Those are the truly pious. Friends, God is still speaking. Let us hear his words. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Peace be upon you all. Thank you very much to Reverend Bonnie and uh, for inviting me here today and for the generosity of spirit uh, that this community has shown me over the years. Uh, indeed, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be with you here today. Um, I'm, uh, this sermon uh, is different than I had anticipated, and I'll explain why. Um, my father, who uh, I'm very close to, is very ill, and I know that this community has been praying for him, and that means the world to me and to my family, uh, and I regularly, I visit him every few days, he's in Boston right now, for getting medical treatment, um, and we've been there for two months, and the doctors have told us it's many more months uh, before we turn a corner and before we get good news, but your prayers are incredibly powerful. I believe that God hears all your prayers, all of our prayers, um, and so, I mean, what can one, who wouldn't want, you know, friends and strangers, uh, loved ones and those who are uh, yet to become beloved to, to pray for them. So I wanted to, to begin with that. Uh, so it's from that space, that mental and spiritual and heart space that I'm really talking about today. So the verse that I wanted to pick to read, it's in your uh, bulletin. It's uh, chapter 55, verse 28. And uh, it says, which of your Lord's blessings will you deny? I'm going to tell you a little bit of context of that chapter of the Quran and of why I picked that verse, and then I'll unpack it, and then I'll share three reflections to conclude. Uh, that chapter, chapter 55, is called Surah Rahman, chapter uh, titled The Merciful. And Muslims believe that God has 99 names, uh, 99 attributes, and uh, one of God's majestic attributes is the merciful. The, uh, the most merciful, in fact. It's in the superlative form in the Arabic. Uh, and, that, and, he, and that's the chapter title here, is the most merciful. Um, now, the verse, th that chapter is very interesting in many ways. I'm not gonna make this an exegesis right now, but I wanna give you a couple of takeaways and why I picked that. Uh, the verse right there, which of your Lord's favors will you deny, is very powerful in the Arabic when you hear it. It's actually repeated 31 times. So after the initial opening, the preamble of the verse, when you get to around verse number 15, 15 to 20, what happens is God starts this uh, sort of oratorical technique where he enumerates all of his blessings. And these are from the blessings that you and I are exposed to and benefit from every day. This is literally the air that we breathe. And God is going through and listing all of these for the reader, for the listener. The air that you breathe, the idea of the night and the day, the day is for work, the night is for rest, that you have creatures that walk the earth, that fly in the, that, you know, God's uh, uh, creation, that all of these are part of his majestic beauty that is created for us. And then talks about loving relationships between families, between, uh, uh, you know, friends, all of the things that you and I, let me just say that I, take too often for granted. So God is listing all of these, and then he intersperses that with this rhetorical line and says, which of God's favors, meaning which of his favors, do you deny? And the idea of deny there is which of them are you negligent of or heedless about, right? And so it goes back and forth, back and forth, for a series of 31 times throughout. Now, the reason I picked that verse is that of all of the verses of the Quran that my father would stress to us, 
uh, uh, when he was young. This was his favorite verse. Like, there's, I can't even tell you how many times in the most seemingly random of occasions, you know, we'd be doing something, we'd be somewhere, something would happen, and then my God, my, my father would just, would repeat this, would repeat this line. Sometimes to, just to himself, but I think more often than not, it was for us to just think about, like, in that moment, this is all, like, we are blessed. And I think he was saying to we, to us, as his children, my father came from a small village in eastern Pakistan, uh, a family of eight siblings. His father was a farmer, and eventually my father, to make his father proud, um, uh, worked incredibly hard, uh, God opened many doors for him, and migrated to the U.S. and became, which I'm so proud of saying, a renowned surgeon. He's a neurosurgeon. Uh, he is someone who absolutely embodies the idea of being a caregiver and someone who loves healing people. Uh, and so, you know, we would, he would come home at night um, and, you know, I guess back in the day I should have asked him more about what his day was like, but my father would just tell us, right? My mom didn't want to hear these stories, so my mom was very squeamish, but my dad would tell us stories about people that got in car accidents that had horrible physical trauma and that he would go and he, he said he was blessed by God to have hands the hands of a surgeon that would go and physically repair people's bodies. And my father would oftentimes tell us, um, he, was very, he is a very religious man, and for people that, patients and patients' families that wanted to pray with him before the surgery, he had no problem whatsoever, irrespective of, of spiritual or faith tradition, or lack thereof, anyone that wanted that presence before the actual surgery. And so, I just, that, that's what speaks to my heart is this verse, which of God's, which of your Lord's favors will you deny? Now, the three things from that verse before I transition are this. The way God sets up this uh, chapter, which is relevant for us, is this. In the beginning, God talks about that justice and order have been established in human societies, but it takes work to keep that justice and order in balance, right? That the, the world and human society can lean towards entropy. That those who want that worship power, that worship status, that worship a sense of disenfranchisement, and there are people in the world like that today that want to marginalize and oppress and silence people, that if those forces are left unchecked, you will have chaos and anarchy in the world. And so God is telling mankind that it's a blessing from God that societies function economically, socially, sociologically, spiritually, interpersonally, uh, environmentally in a harmonious way. And that we as God's creation on earth have the responsibility to maintain that balance uh, in the world. Second, then God goes on and uh, as I said, He enumerates all of the blessings, the physical blessings that we take for granted, the air that we breathe, the sunlight that benefits us, and, and on and on. And at the very end, what God talks about in that chapter, and this is going to be my transition, is that God reminds the reader or the listener that everything except God is mortal. Everything will perish except the majestic beauty and the face of God, as the Quran says. And it reminds us of our own humanity. And I think maybe that's why this verse really spoke to my dad, to my father, as, as, a, as a really blessed and privileged surgeon to say that we do the best that we can with the opportunities and the privilege that we have. And that if we, if we um, use the blessings properly, then that is pleasing to God. But you know that ultimately we all return to God. Now I want to pivot actually, um, uh, and I want to uh, mention my dear brother from another mother that's with me here in the audience today, Abdurrahman Malik, which we're blessed to have here in the, he's moved to the New Haven community last year. And so he's really, in my 20 year friendship with him, has informed more, in more ways than he knows my thoughts on this. Uh, and there's another friend of mine named Sister Hussein Mujeddidi who lives in uh, California. And so from this I'm going to pivot and I want to share some thoughts with you. When we talk about the idea of God's blessings and God's favors, I want to leave you with two ideas. The first is one of responsibility, and the next is one of generosity. And when it comes to the idea of responsibility, you know, in Islam we have a word, and I won't spend too much time on the Arabic, but there's a word in the Arabic called amana. And amana literally translates to a trust. So that when I give you something that's very valuable to me, and I entrust it to you, and I say, take care of this for me, I, look, I, I trust that you're going to be able to look after this. And that at some point in time, I will need to come back and ask for this, for, for you to return this to me. That idea in Islam, which is in many ways, really the crux of the social fabric, right, of human societies, 
but that we have trust with each other, between friends, between spouses, between families, between communities, and then from communities, between societies, and between societies, between civilizations, is the fact that I'm not here to do you harm. I'm here, or I hope to be here, as a bridge builder, and a peacemaker, and a peace giver. So the idea of aman. And so the idea that we build in the Muslim tradition is that amana, which is the idea of a trust, is in fact a trust from God. The idea of trust and responsibility is a trust and a responsibility from God that He's given to humankind. And that in our way, in our lives, irrespective of where you are because of age, or class, or gender, or race, or ethnicity, we all have those relationships, right? Those bonds, those valent bonds of responsibility. So I'm going to go through a list. That wealth is an amana. Wealth is a trust. And that we may very well be asked what we did with our wealth. Power is an amana. That what, what did those that have power do to empower the disempowered? Knowledge is an amana. And I say this very self-consciously and self-critically as someone who resides in the privileged bubble of Yale. That knowledge and intelligence are trusts. Religious activism is an amana. Fame is an amana. Beauty is an amana. Health, good health, is a blessing and responsibility from God. Talent is an amana. Being a parent is an amana. Friendship, to be a friend to others and to be befriended by others, is an idea of a responsibility that we have. Serving one's community is an amana. Public service and activism are forms of an amana of trust. And maybe apropos to the time we live in, being an influencer is an amana. That there are people in our society, in our communities, in our lives, that we look to for inspiration, for motivation, for some sense of when the, you know, you're looking, your life is, my life, let me put it this way, has turbulence, has moments of chaos, moments of weakness, moments of vulnerability, and there's people that I look to that exert a positive influence in my life, and that role is also an amani. And so in today's world, when we have access to all of this knowledge and information and power and all of that, we all have a voice. Now, I don't in any way deny that there are some privileged voices and there are some disempowered, marginalized voices. But whatever voice that we have, we, the mind, if the mindset is that it's a blessing from God, the voice, however small it may be, but the question is, how am I going to use that voice? To do God's work. One of the things that I love, the many things that I love in this community, in this congregation, are the, the uh, tapestries that you have hanging right outside the door. That it says, on your way out, our worship has ended, and let our service begin. And that really speaks to my heart, the idea of, there is a time and place for worshiping God, in your respective form and your modality. But the worship of God that extends beyond God's house is the service to God's creation. Now, shifting in the interest of time from the idea of responsibility, which is a blessing from God, is to one of generosity. Now, we have a choice every day. With all the blessings that we've given, is what do we do with them? There are many, I mean, I'm, there are many things that can be said, but for our purposes, I want to dwell on this final thought of generosity. And um, in my tradition, what it's said to be regularly checking your intentions with the wealth, with the health, with the power, with the fame, with the voice. What are you doing with those? And how are you showing your gratitude to God for His generosity? And remember, why you engage with the world, not necessarily just how you engage with the world. That is the, the realm of, it, of, of the intention. But the idea here is that being generous is a virtue that I think I may safely say Across religious and spiritual and philosophical traditions, we can laud as one of the great virtues of humanity, of generosity. But the idea is that what do you do? How do we use our imagination, especially in the time that we live in today, to be generous? Now, of course, for, in a good way, we often think of generosity as the hand that gives, and the hand that gives material wealth. And that's beautiful. And I think all our traditions talk about the value and the power and the redeeming power of giving alms. Right, the purification, the spiritual purification, and the physical purification that comes to your wealth from giving, so that you don't hoard wealth, but that you actually share wealth. But now let's imagine the other ways that we can be generous. 
We can be generous with our time. We can be generous with our help and assistance. We can be generous with our listening. We can be generous with our teaching, and hopefully with our preaching. We can be generous with our smiles and with our laughter. We can be generous with our ideas and with our creativity. We can be generous with our advice. We can be generous with our empathy. We can be generous with our affection in an increasingly cold and increasingly inhospitable world. We can be generous with our recommendations for beneficial things. We can be generous with our compliments. We can be generous with our food and drink that we share with the, with the hungry and thirsty. We can be generous with our care and our concern for the sick and the elderly. We can be generous with our space, as this community so often is. We can be generous with our excuses that we make for others. We can be generous with our forgiveness. We can be generous with the words that we respond to people's heartfelt messages and words to us. We can be generous with our wisdom. We can be generous with our talent. We can be generous with our protection for those who are unprotected. We can be generous with the position that we hold in society or in an institution. And we can be generous, finally, with the desire to remove the burdens of others, be they financial, be they uh, emotional, be, be they uh, mental health related or spiritual concerns. The generosity that we have with the desire to, in any way to help remove even a slight burden. In our tradition, the Prophet Muhammad said that there are many levels of faith and the lowest level of faith is removing something harmful from the path of your neighbors. So I invite us to think about the ways that we can be generous in our giving and to become, to just aspire in your own ways, in your own lives, in your own moments in your lives to be more generous. And this, I want to acknowledge that this is an incredibly generous community. Now I want to share with you, I want to end with a story. Uh, uh, I've done a lot of preaching and it's, it's in, uh, I, I want to bring in our tradition into it and I'll end with a story. When we talk about generosity of character and what it means, um, and there are, I mean, my spiritual and religious tradition abounds in them, as does, uh, as does the Christian tradition, as do, I, I, dare I say, all of the religious and spiritual and philosophical traditions. But the story I want to share with you is this, because to me it really kind of, you know, it's not just talk, it's not just preaching, it's living, living the message. So there's a story that's said about the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that once he was in a gathering with his students, with his community, and there was an old poor man that walked into their gathering. And many of the, uh, the, the Prophet's students in this particular narration were young people, and young people have a vibrancy and an energy and a vitality for change and for being change agents and change makers. I want to do something in the world against the oppression and the tyranny that they see. But it's interesting, right, in the way this is set up, that there's young people that are literally sitting at the feet of the Prophet to learn from him, and a poor old man walks in. And it's described that the man walked in with a handful of grapes. And he came and he sat down. He wanted to join the circle. And so the Prophet, as was his prophetic noble practice, is he made room. So he shifted to the side and he invited the visitor in to sit, which is an honored position in our tradition, to sit in physical proximity. Because physical proximity can be an avenue to attain spiritual proximity. Not always, but many times. So what happens is the Prophet invites the man in to sit next to him and the man is very happy and excited to be not just sitting with the Prophet but he's offering something to the Prophet. So he brings his bunch of grapes and he gives it to the Prophet and the Prophet, because it was offered to him as a gift, he took one of the grapes from the bunch and he bit into it and ate it. And now the man is talking to him and he's saying, tell us about just where you're from, getting to know him. It's a very normal, pleasant encounter. And the Prophet takes another grape and he eats it and he's talking, he takes another grape, and he eats it, and he continues, until the grapes are all finished. And then the man is very satisfied with the personal attention and care that the Prophet of God has given him. So the man leaves elated. I mean, his heart is full. I came to sit with the Prophet of God, and he was present with me, and he listened to me, he heard me, and the man leaves in that state. And now after the man is, has departed, one of the young people, as young people are prone to do. He's very inquisitive. And he says, oh, prophet of God, when we've sat with you in the past, it's your noble practice that when you're given a gift of food, 
that you'll partake and then you share with the rest of us. And the Prophet would oftentimes, would, would always start from the right and then the circle would go all the way around so that everyone had a fair share from the Prophet's bounty that God had sent him. And he said, but we noticed today, you ate all the grapes. And you know, that's how one of us would say, that's how I would say it. And then the Prophet turned to them and smiled and said, you see your brother that came, this old man? And he came and he brought a gift. And I bit into the grape, and the grape was sour and rotten. And if I had passed it to one of you, what do you think would have happened? One of you would have bitten into a sour grape and would have maybe made a face or grimaced or maybe let out a little, you know, a little sign of disgust. What would that have done to the man's heart? He would have known. He would have been embarrassed and humiliated that his gift, rather than a source of comfort in the, in the, in the gathering of the prophet of God, was now a source of embarrassment. So I ate all the grapes to not put you in that, in that situation, to save the heart of that man. And so it's a lesson for me first and foremost when we talk about God's blessings, of the people that God has given us in our lives, of the circumstances that God has given us in our lives, of the physical, the material, and the immaterial. And so I say to myself first and foremost, I want to be someone that is more generous of spirit and that is more responsible with the gifts that they've been given. Thank you very much.